people are just getting recruiting wrong and it's causing them to strike out and it's costing a lot of money. I feel like it's just part of the business that dentists just aren't familiar with. I had one particular private practice client, pretty successful. He had like three or four practices. He was an implant guy. He was driving, you know, multiple millions of dollars of revenue every year. And the way that he hired associates was literally like, he was, it was adamant that he had to take them out, have a glass of scotch with them, have a handshake, and then they would literally start the next week. And then in the same vein, he was like, but I'm going through like six associates a year at this one practice. And I'm like, Doc, you have no idea. You're, you're basically taking them out on a date. You're shaking a hand. Yeah. And, and then, then you're, you're marrying you're them. giving them a job. Yeah. And you're putting them in front of your patients. Like you're doing a disservice to everybody involved here. If you're comfortable, you're not growing. Welcome to another episode of Dental Marketing Theory. My name is Gary Bird and I'm your host. I am the CEO of SMC National. We provide predictable new patient flow for dental offices just like yours. So if you ever need more new patients, we're the people to talk to. But today we're gonna to talk to somebody actually much more important than just getting new patients, Mr. Ron Brush. He's the CEO of The Dentist Agent and I've actually had multiple conversations with him. He helps you get the right kind of dentist into your practice. Talk about something that everybody needs, right? Uh, it's kind of hard to do dentistry if you don't have dentist, right? And so he, he, the reason I'm bringing him on the show is we had a conversation a couple months back and he was sharing these crazy stories of people who were trying to grow their practices, recruiting the wrong way. And then he was sharing with me some of the strategies of how to do it right. And I'm really, really excited to talk with him today. So Ron, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I would love for you to kind of share how you ended up in the dental industry. Just share a little bit about your history. Well, first, thanks for having me, Gary. I really appreciate it. Um, it's really interesting. So I've been in recruiting for 25 years. And, you know, I got into HR and recruiting because literally I graduated with an English and philosophy degree and didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> and my best friend, since I've been five, got an HR degree. And he got into HR right out of school and he got me a recruiting job and I just fell in love with recruiting. Was that in dental? Uh, no, no, that was in um, security agents in, in Boston way back in the day. But, mm -hmm. and then I went through an IT phase cause you know, back in 2000, it was really big IT. Uh, but that same friend actually got a job at Aspen Dental when they had less than 40 practices. Wow. And uh, he eventually was put in charge of recruiting and he called me the day he was put in charge of recruiting. So I need a really good recruiter. That's how I got into dental. Um, so I've been in dental for 15 years and I've seen, you know, I was with Aspen when they had 50 practices and I left when they had 325. Wow. Um, and I was there for four years. So, and I was their new office guy. So I was the recruiter going into new markets, getting tomatoes thrown at me. Like, you know, I would go to the Iowa dental conference, you know, representing, you know, the Walmart of dentistry. Yep, that's how I was dude, yeah. And, you know, the guys on the dental board and everything else would come to the booth and just harass me. So how would you get dentists to come work with you? Because I, I know that, that that was DSOs were by frowned on by 99.9% .9 of people at that time in the dental industry. So how would you actually recruit if people were, everybody had that negative mindset towards what you were doing? Well, the sales pitch from a DSO perspective actually hasn't changed significantly over that 10 year period, 15 year period. Really, at the end of the day, what you go to doctors with, especially new grads, new grads are kind of like, you know, the target audience. But we take care of the front end part of the business, which they don't know anyways coming out of school. So you can focus on your clinical skills and we'll pay you probably more than you'd make on your in your private practice world, because out of the gate, we're going to guarantee you some money and we're going to give you mentorship and we're going to provide all these bells and whistles you may or may not get in the private practice world. We negotiate with payers. We do all this stuff for you. You literally have to show up and just be a doctor. And we're going to help you do that. Mm. That's the pitch pretty much from every DSO out there. Right? Got it. Give or take. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, it, how true that is, like, you know, in a lot of things nowadays, they're all promising mentorship and everything else. And yeah. to a degree, you know, I think even private practice worlds, you know, private practice owners really do talk a lot about mentorship as well. But I think there's a disconnect there with the new grad, what they define mentorship as versus what you know, the employer is defining it as. Yeah, right? so let's let's talk about that because I just had an episode with actually an associate dentist. So he's that's his career is he's associate dentist. He has some side hustles that he does around Invisalign, helping doctors learn how to sell more Invisalign. And he's like, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be an owner. I don't want to open up practices. And he said the number one thing that he wanted was mentorship. And I've heard that consistently. That's the, what people the, the new grads want. 
And he said, I basically never got it anywhere along the road. Some were better, some were worse, but it was never anywhere in the stratosphere of what I thought it was going to be. And what he said about the single practitioners is they were so busy doing dentistry, making money, they didn't have time to stop and slow down and explain it to me. It was kind of just like, watch me and you'll see. Is, is that kind of what you see as well? Or what? how do you see the the mentorship kind of shifting and changing in the DSO world? Oh, I, de- you know, in the private practice world, I think that's the best mentorship you're ever going to get is watch me do this a couple of times and then go do it on your own. Yeah, I mean, it's a business, right? They need to make money. They need to see patients. And if you're a single guy bringing in an associate, you don't have time to sit with the associate hand in hand maybe like an instructor would do in a, in a residency program. That just doesn't happen. And to be honest with you, it doesn't happen at the DSO level either. Even though all of the DSOs do promise some type of mentorship on some level, at the end of the day, they're driven by revenue and production numbers. And you know they will throw new grads in by themselves in a practice day one. It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's a sink or swim. Now, I do think, though, that the attitude of the new grad needs to change a little bit, too. Okay. Right? Like, I think, that, you know, they come out of school and I think that they're so just they're not confident enough in their clinical skills. And they're 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 afraid to try some procedures by themselves. Mm-hmm. And if they can't get over that hump, they're really never going to be the greatest doctor anyways. Right. Like, yeah, I yeah. feel like you're providing a lower level of care if you're scared drilling into a tooth. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. But on the same token, I do think, though, expectations of a new grad, like from a production perspective, 2500 a day and less is realistic, at least for the first six months, depending on what school they went to. That's the other thing. You know, these schools are putting out varying degrees of really. Okay, I've never heard. Uh I mean, I'm I'm sure it's true, but I've just never thought of it that way. What what are the biggest What's the big gap that you see? What is the gap that, that these kids are well, coming out? Okay, for instance, you know, when I was recruiting in the, in New England, we had one school. And I don't want to call out schools, although I do talk to candidates and I will be very direct with them about what level of school they went to and what I expect from them in the real world out of the gate. So it really what it comes down to is requirements for graduation, Gary. So, so some schools were requiring, you know, 10 extractions. Some are requiring 200. Wow. Imagine the difference in, you know, experience. Who, who, who's doing 200 and who's doing 20? Like, who do you, can you say the diff, this is the requirements that they have? Or are you allowed to say well, that? I, I'd rather talk about the pause, the ones I love. Okay. okay talk let's about talk the about ones the love. ones I love. Okay. Um, I will say that the newer dental schools have figured it out much better, even though they're more expensive to go to. Uh, Midwestern and Lecom are two schools that are literally putting uh, their third year students in externships and getting real world dentistry experience year three. Traditional dental schools weren't doing that at all. Year four was the clinical year, da 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 da, they would go to the clinic. Um, the other thing is they're getting implant experience out in school, Okay, um, which is exceptionally rare. There's probably maybe 30 or 40 schools that are doing that out of the 72, 76 that are out there. Um, so that's I'd, huge. I'd say so eight. as you do your recruiting, you know right off the bat who to go after if someone wants to do implants, as an example. It's only going to be at these schools that they're going to come out with that experience. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and so as you're hiring these doc, like, you know, in a DSO space, like let's take Aspen, for example, because I'm most familiar with Aspen. Mm-hmm. Aspen has to hire 1,400 doctors a year <sighs> to manage, you know, not only their de novo growth, but also their doctor turnover. Right. Yeah. So they're pulling doc. They don't care what dental school you went to. But at the end of the day, you know, the capabilities they're hiring and they're putting some of these associates, a lot of the Aspen dental practices are in second and third tier markets. So what does that mean? Define second and third tier markets for us? In terms of like uh, population size. Got it. So okay. it, it's more rural. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying, there's less candidates willing to go to these places. So yes. what you see is, you know, Heartland and Aspen and Pacific and Smile Brands. In order to get doctors to go to these places, they offer significant sign on bonuses. They offer significant daily rates. You know, nowadays it's like a thousand bucks a day for a new grad. In fact, I just talked to a brand new 2023 graduate in Georgia. He had an offer in hand from Heartland. The offer was 1200 a day guaranteed for the first year and a $50,000 sign-on bonus. He was going into a practice and he was going to be the only doctor at that practice in Georgia. Wow. He's a, he's a brand new grad. He could be, he could basically see maybe six patients a day. In my mind, from a, from a business perspective, you're losing a ton of money on this guy. Yeah. At least the first six months, right? Well, so I got a story for you. So I know a doctor who went to Heartland 
He graduated uh-huh. with about a half a million dollars in debt. Heartland offered him to buy his first practice and build a de novo for him right out of school. Wow. Wow. He now he well, went on. He's know. very I, successful. He's very he's one of their most successful dentists now. But I oh it's almost like you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. This is my gut feeling. It's kind of like so recruiting in dental is almost becoming like recruiting in the NBA. So in the NBA, you have to not only recruit the talent, can you shoot a jump shot? Can you pass the ball? Can you play defense? But what's your work ethic going to be like too? Right. And that's, or am I going to get a LeBron James or am I going to get an Anthony Bennett? Well, in, in, in that same vein, Gary, I think, you know, hand skills and clinical skill sets during the interview process, you don't know, like, uh, unless you see them cut into a tooth, unless you see them actually chair sign, you have no idea what capabilities these guys have. And to be honest with you, some of the greatest, pro- most productive doctors, I've, I've, I've hired over 1,100 doctors in 46 states. And some of the most productive doctors graduated last in their class, as opposed to the graduating you know, first in their class. You, you never know from an academic perspective versus hand skill perspective. It, it doesn't translate all, 100% of the time, right? And most of these, the interview process at the general DSO is this. You talk to a recruiter. Then you talk to either a regional or an owner, whoever the owner is. You go visit the practice. Then they send you a contract. There's no hands on. They have no idea what kind of dentist you are. You know what I mean? Like, so whenever I talk to my clients, I'm always recommending, especially private practice guys, a, a working interview. Working interviews are the best way to figure out whether a candidate can actually cut into a tooth and be comfortable doing it and can interact with your team and do all that other stuff you need to do as a dentist. You know yeah. what I mean? So let's so let's talk. Yeah, totally. So let's talk through that. So what are what are some of the horror stories that you're seeing out there just in your career? You've shared some of them with me already, but like just where people are just getting recruiting wrong and it's causing them to strike out and it's costing them a lot of money. And then on the back end of that, what are we doing? What are you doing to help people get it right? That's a great question. I, I feel like um, it's just part of the business that dentists just aren't familiar with. Do you know what I mean? So uh, I had one particular private practice client, pretty successful. He had like three or four practices. He was an implant guy. He was driving, you know, multiple millions of dollars of revenue every year. And the way that he hired associates was literally like he was it was adamant that he had to take them out, have a glass of scotch with them, have a handshake. And then they would literally start the next week. And then in the same vein, he was like, but I'm going through like six associates a year at this one practice. And I'm like, Doc, you have no idea. You're, you're basically taking them out on a date. You're shaking a hand. Yeah. And, and then, then you're, you're, marrying you're them. giving them a job. Yeah. And you're putting them in front of your patients. Like you're doing a disservice to everybody involved here, you know, um, to the flip side of that, though, you know, I will say what I've seen a lot of the private practice guys do is where they they're tripped up, not only on the in the selection process, because they may spend 10 or 15 minutes. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know how to interact with a candidate in any way, shape or form. Right. They're not formally trained in interviewing. And then they, they give them a contract written by an attorney who knows nothing about dentistry. I've seen that, too. Like I, I've, I've seen. I've seen where these people give the contract and they're like, yeah, see, I'm going to get 20% of collections over here and 35 over here. So yeah, I'm going exactly. to the 35 and it's like, well, how much production does that office do? Right. Versus the, oh, I don't know. It's like, wait, 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 it doesn't, I'd rather have 20% of a million than 35% of a hundred thousand. Like that's a huge difference. So the right. percentage almost doesn't matter. So you always, you have all these moving parts and I think it's really confusing to people. So how, how do you, how do you help them navigate that? Well, from a candidate, so I'm much more candidate. We are much more candidate driven than client driven. Like there's a more than enough clients. So what does that right? mean? Like to find that, like if I'm a dentist, pretend I'm a dentist and you're talking to me, like what does that mean that you're candidate driven? Are you an rather employer than, or are you a candidate? So I'm a dentist and I want to hire people to okay, grow so my DSO. So I have five okay. practices and I want to grow to 10 practices. I come to Ron and I say, Ron, I need help. I need more dentists. I don't have enough dentists to keep growing. Well, and I say to you, doc, I got a 24 question questionnaire. That I'm going to send to you about your practice. And I'm going to dive deep into every single conversation on an assessment level with a candidate in regards to your practice. And then I flip the script and ask the candidate the same 24 questions. Got it. Okay. And I try to make the match that way. So I'm not wasting your time. When I present to you a candidate, they've already been through everything about your practice. They know how many patients you expect them to see. They know what your production expectations are. They know what your collection rate is. They know what your compensation structure is like. They know all that stuff. So then all you have to do is really get to know them and figure out whether you gel from a clinical perspective, right? Um, and then, you know, introduce them to the team, maybe do a couple of hours of working interview. Working interview is the best way to do it. Yeah. Really, it is. 
Um, but when I mean click candidate driven, I'm never going to try to convince slam a candidate into a job just to get a fill for me. Got it. It doesn't work that way. Got it. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's not going to last anyways. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so the way that I work is I gain credibility with candidates because I tell them what questions to ask. Like you mentioned, you know, certain percentages of collections. That's usually how you're compensated on. I always tell all my candidates, you got to get the last six month collection rate at the practice. Mm. If they're not collecting money, yeah. that impacts your ability to get to make money, right? Like you're not going to get paid. Yeah. So I, I have a, a thing that I'm doing with UCLA, uh, the dental school over there. And we've talked about with our students on, you have to, you have to understand who you're going to work for. How yes. do, how many new patients do they currently have? How yes. many do they have the capability of getting and then I, I worked with them from a marketing perspective to ask the right questions because they can just say, oh, yeah, we're going to get new, more new patients. Well, it's, it's not always that simple, right? Like if, it, if you're in the wrong market or if you don't have a skilled marketing person, you might not be able to get those new patients. And then you're stuck at a job where you don't have work to do and you're getting paid 40% of nothing, but it's right. still nothing. Right. Well, you know, I worked for a DSO who literally believed that if you added an associate, patients would come. And it was like the recipe for freaking disaster. So I tell all of my candidates, not only do you ask for the last six month collection rate, you always want to get the last six month new patient flow, especially in a PPO fee for service world. If you're in that world, the average rule of thumb, Gary, is 30 to 40 new patients per month per doctor. Yep. If you see those numbers, everybody's going to make their money, right? Yep. But yep. there's so many times when I'll get a private practice owner, he said, yeah, I'm seeing 15 new a month, but I need to add an associate. I'm like, Oh, well, are you retiring? Right? Like, are you leaving the chair? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. One hundred percent. I totally get it. So, so what? So you said you tell dentists to ask. The first thing is it just they ask a lot of the wrong questions. What are some of those wrong questions that they're asking? Oh well, um, you know, the HR violation questions, right? Like, <laughs> I'll get man, I'll get owners that'll be like, "Well, is she going to get pregnant in the first twelve months? Because I don't want that." You know what I mean? Like, Dude, don't say, say that. Like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I had an owner the other day said, I'm surrounded by bitches. I can't take another woman in my life at all. Um, and people will say things to me and I'd be like, okay, listen, doctor, that violates 50 different HR things. You can't be saying that stuff out loud, right? Like, um, wow. you know, I saw a contract the other day, private practice gave a contract to a candidate of mine. That's the other thing that I offer. So I helped write the doctor contract for Aspen and for General Dental, very familiar with contracts. So whenever I get a candidate they get, they may get contracts from outside, you know, other people that aren't clients of mine. I'll review it with them and tell them what they can negotiate and stuff. And I saw a contract last week that actually had a clause in it from a private practice that said 12 months post employment. If we have to redo any of your work, we're invoicing you for it. So that means at, a year after they've left, if a patient comes back and says, Hey, you got to redo my crown. You're going to get a bill from that doctor. Who would go? And yeah. Like, why would anybody go work with that? Why would you? Work exactly. I, I told that candidate run far away. First of all, you and I both know you get 10 doctors in a room. They look at one x-ray. You get 10 different treatment plans. They can yeah. choose to redo everything this guy did and double dip. Right. Like, <sighs> is that even legal? Can you even do that? I have no idea. That was in Oregon. I, oh, I don't man. know. I have no idea. Okay. One thing that I've heard a lot about uh, a lot of DSOs that they do is they, they always want the spouse in the room. So they want the spouse to know that the spouse is bought in, that they want to move there, that they understand all the, because, because people have dealt with, you know, they move, uh, move a guy out there to rural Texas or whatever. And then the spouse isn't happy and they quit. And it's like, well, we told you everything, but sometimes, you know, people don't communicate. What's your thoughts on that? Is that you, do you take the same approach or? Well, when it comes to relocation, you have to, like, you know how many times I've sent the spouse flowers or, you know, if, if it's the husband, some tickets to a sports game, right? Like, uh, it's adamant that, it, especially when you're dealing with Aspen, where you are moving people, you're moving people to more rural locations. You have to get whoever the partner is on board. Otherwise, it's not going to be a long-term solution. Now, the one thing I will tell you, though, Aspen is all about a numbers game, right? And a lot of these larger DSOs are pure numbers driven. So what I mean by that is it doesn't really matter. Like at the end of the day, they're not even really hiring for retention. They're just hiring to get numbers in the door. They need doctors. They need to get production going. That's the name of the game, right? Um, turnover doesn't really, and I will tell you, turnover at the DSO space is significantly underreported. Significantly. Why, why, why is that? Why is it underreported? 
Well, for two reasons. One, usually they're owned by some equity firm who they have to report to. Uh, and they get real creative with how they determine turnover, right? Like yeah. one of the DSOs I work for just didn't include part-time doctors, but we hired all of our specialists as part-time, <laughs> right? Like, you were talking about a couple hundred doctors here. Uh, yeah, there was another time where I literally reported to the CFO that said, I said, listen, our turnover numbers are about 20% less than what we've been reporting because I was doing forecasts as the director of talent acquisition. Yeah. I had to do forecasts, yeah. right? So I was calculating the correct turnover number at the doctor level. And I was like, hey, listen, man, we've been reporting these numbers way wrong. I got a message back from our CFO saying, if you bring up turnover again, you're fired. Huh. And it was that was in writing. <laughs> so they're just so it's just like, hey, we're just going to we're going to cover this up. We got we got people we have to answer to. Yep. Yeah. And is there any other reason they're sweeping it under the rug? Is there anything to do with just like public reputation and things like that? Well, public reputation. Yeah. So the general rule of thumb when I was out recruiting, you know, when I was on the kind of the, the concert, right, um, tour was 20 percent. You never said anything more than 20 percent. That was the general standard, you know, and everybody kind of assumes, OK, 20 percent, that's reasonable. But at the end of the day, my take on doctor turnover, especially at the DSO space, is probably closer to 30 to 45 percent in that range. So if we can break that down for me. If I'm a DSO and I have a thousand dentists, I'm going to have 34 to 40 of those turning over, 35 to 40 of those turning, leaving every year. No, no, that's 300 to 400. Oh, 300 to 400. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes. a thousand, I have a thousand dentists, 300 yes. to 400 are leaving every year. Yes. So that, so just cover that. I just got to, I got to keep those that flowing in. That's not even counting growth. So that's so much work and so much cost there. So why, so here's my question. And this is what I've always wondered is like, why don't businesses focus more on retention if this is such a big problem? Yeah, that's a, you know, <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I don't quite understand. I was in a, I was in an operations meeting, a senior leadership meeting, and I had these meetings all the time where I think the problem at the DSO space is at the regional manager level. They don't get any training. And if there's not an owner in the, in the region a, a doctor, I mean, then everybody reports up to the regional manager. I actually, I, I was a director of ops for 18 months. So I was that guy. I, we didn't have owners in our group. Um, and what happens is, they're so overwhelmed. They get zero training. They basically throw you in. So what they'll do is they'll take an office manager who, who has done fantastic, right? They bring a 20% plus EBITDA in. Then all of a sudden they give this office manager 20 practices. <laughs> Go do your thing, right? With zero training. Yeah. And now all of a sudden the doctors are reporting to this kind of glorified office manager, right? Um, and that's what really causes the friction. Yeah, and I think, and I think at the, so correct me if I'm wrong at this. Like I feel like at the office level, as an office manager, you're in the weeds all day, every day. You're in the battle, so to speak, with everybody. And so that, yeah, there's still drama and stuff, but you just kind of steamroll through that because you got patients coming in today, right? And right. by the time you leave, there's patients. Patients are there all day, and then tomorrow it's, it's you start over again. So it just doesn't give you that room. You are managing and you are you know having to work with people, and it's super hard. Like that's that's really really hard. But then when you go to regional, you're not in the crosshairs anymore you're going and and working at an elevated level but you're still working with everybody who's in the in in the front lines so that's a, such a big difference it's such a big move well and you're held responsible for revenue numbers at the regional level mm. right like, and you have to hit these certain targets so i've been in meetings where i've had regional say to me i need to replace doctor in this location in this location in this location and i'll ask why why are we replacing these doctors and their response is, well, I'm not getting any, I'm, they're not producing. So then I start asking questions like, okay, well, have we set them up for success? You know, from what I understand in this particular location, we're on office manager number three. The doctor hasn't had a significant, you know, presence from an assistant perspective. He's gone through three assistants and he's seeing 15 new patients a month. And we want him to do 80 grand in production for the month. It's not going to happen. Like, we haven't set them up for success. And I used to lose these arguments all the time. Gary. At the end of the day, it's like, you just got to, we need to find a producer. And what they don't understand is, okay, yeah, you can fire this guy. And in the interim, you're still losing all the production, yeah. daily production, right? Like, it, does, it didn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. Um, so, so, so one of the, one of the ways that I know, well, one of the things that fascinates me is like, I talk to all these groups, all these DSOs, I see people post their, their growth and what their targets are and all those kind of things. Well, if everybody yeah. grows, 
the way they want to, there's not enough doctors. There's just not. Right. Like someone's going to get caught holding the bag without a doctor. And so it really, then it doesn't, there, yes, you still need to recruit, but retention becomes your most important thing to actually accomplish your goal. If you figure out retention, you can actually win and and beat everybody to the punch because you don't have to recruit as much. It, but then to is is part of retention ownership and is that why people don't want to do it is that part of the equation in there i think it's a piece to me from a d okay the larger their dso the less honest they are up front when they're recruiting gary and i tell all of the candidates this listen they paint this rosy picture where it's going to be absolutely dental heaven for you to come work for us we're going to give you all so the when you say less honest is that withholding info or giving painting a and, and, and uh, not an accurate picture I think the gap between what they present versus what reality is for these candidates is large. Got it. And depending on which DSO they go to, it's bigger, right? And you have to ask the right questions. Like Heartland has a great reputation for clinical support for their doctors. Great reputation. But where Heartland falls short is new patient flow. They struggle with new patient flow and they struggle with operational support at the regional level. It's a disaster. So, and what Heartland also does is they give you this huge daily rate as a doctor that's a draw against your percentage. But if they're not seeing a new patient flow, you're never gonna make up that draw. Now you never have to pay it back, but you're never gonna hit that percentage number. Do you know what I mean? Like you're always in the red. Every month you're in the red because you got this huge draw. And eventually they're gonna have to part ways with you because right? eventually they're losing money on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, um, that totally what, makes what sense. What I think though, I, tell, I used to tell my, I tell my buddy who's still at Aspen, like if they were just honest and upfront about certain things. Yeah. Like what types of you know procedure mix you're going to be doing, right? Like a lot of these DSOs have models you have to fit into, Gary. Like Aspen's no, got yeah. a model, yep. right? Yeah. Well, so um, Aspen's and, better at the customer acquisition side. Yes. And But then your probably quality of life as a dentist isn't going to be as great from the clinical mm -hmm. side. And, like, and, and then I also understand what you're saying about Heart, uh, uh, yeah, Heartland because they let you name your practice whatever you want and however you want to manage it from a marketing standpoint. They let you do it however you want. Yeah, they're prob you're probably not going to get as good of results as if you do the Pacific model or the Aspen model, which is right. using a similar system over and over and over again. And that system just keeps getting better and better. So it's, there's always a give and take, isn't there? Yes. Yes. And, and each one has their pros and cons. You know, I tell all of my candidates, listen, the DSO space has earned its negative reputation to a degree. But what you don't hear are the crazy town private practice owners <laughs> who are like, you know, literally molesting every woman that comes into their practice, right? Like th there's still some crazy horror stories there too. Mm. You just don't hear about it because it was one associate they blew out because, you know, the larger DSLs are blowing out 800 associates a year. Wow. It's, the numbers are different. Yeah. Uh, so what's, okay. So what, what, what is easy and what's hard? So what, right now in recruiting, and you do just dentist, right? You do, do you do other? I do dentist. We do dentist and executives. Okay, so perfect. At the DSL space. Yep. Okay, perfect. So what what's easy and what's hard right now in the recruiting game? Well, the easiest thing is location. Location is the biggest thing. Like COVID has really changed candidates' desire to relocate or move to an area where they know no one or they have no connection to. When I first started recruiting, I could especially even with H one B visa candidates which is a decent population in the dental space, right? That's, that's you people, know, you define go, that for me, define the visa, H, the, 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 the visa There are students. foreign trained doctors who have gone to a United States dental school. And once they graduate from the dental school in the United States, they have a year to find an employer who will sponsor them for their visa. And the sponsorship is really like five grand. It's not a big deal. And these candidates usually are willing to work the late hours, the mornings, you know, they're much more flexible. Um, there's some pros there. Right. And it's only five grand to sponsor one time, five grand fee. It's not that big of a deal, especially if you're offering 50 grand sign on bonuses. Right. But there is a risk, though, with H1Bs because they go into a lottery and some of them don't make don't get granted the visa no matter what. Even you. So you there is a risk that you could spend the money to sponsor them and they don't make it through the lottery and then they get kicked out anyways of the country. That happens. Like, I, I, I think two years ago, Aspen hired 24 H1Bs, but only 19 of them made it through the lottery. Got it. So, but, you know, traditionally when I first started, you could, you could talk to an H-1B and say, listen, I'm going to need you to go to East Jesus Land, Iowa for your first year because we're opening up. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'm going to need you to go to very rural Iowa. This is yeah. what I, and they're like, as long as you sponsor me, I'll go wherever you need me to go. Got it. Nowadays, it's not that. It, it, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't fly. So I think the easiest thing is location. When you're considering de novo growth, 
or acquisition growth, please consider the population of doctors or the attractability of doctors in that specific location. I'm yeah. dealing with like, I'm working with a client right now that has about 50 practices and they continually buy practices in very rural areas. Yeah, I mean like- Cause that's a know, strategy because they don't have competition from other dentists, right? So there's a, there's a, you put open a practice and then you have all these Medicaid patients or all these certain kind of patients that you want, want right out of the box. Patient flow is definitely there in the rural areas. Access to care. That was one of the, that's one of the hallmarks of Aspen's model, right? Is access to care. That you have already a built in patient base. But the challenge is, especially now post COVID, getting someone to go to a rural area who has no connection there. You, you know, it's really like hard. I, just, I got really lucky. I placed a doctor in Wasilla, Alaska. And it's because she was born in Wasilla. <laughs> like I got lucky. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, so how, so Alaska where, if you were going to build, so if I came to you right now and I said, okay, I'm going to start banging out DeNovos, I'm, yep. where should I build them? Like if, well, from okay, a recruiting so, standpoint, just recruiting, that's all I care about. The, the most attractive states right now for doctors, I'll tell you, Texas, Florida, Cal, well, California has a lot, but California, California has 30,000 dentists. The next one is, is 15,000 between New York and Texas. Oh, wow. And then it's 12,000 Florida. And then, but uh, see the thing down. with California that I've seen that's interesting. Like I worked with a doctor that was in uh, Santa Barbara. Ooh, the, wow. the 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 cost of living there's crazy. Like it's like you're gonna pay ten million dollars for a house. You know what I mean? Like the, that kind of stuff, right? It's just yes. absolutely insane. And so it's really really expensive to live there. You're gonna make a lot of money living there, but it's not gonna cover the difference. You're you're actually gonna live way below what you would live in other areas. Now it's beautiful and it's sunny all the time. So that, that, but yes, good luck getting somebody to move from Texas to Santa Barbara or Tennessee to Santa Barbara. So there's, there's these little pockets. I feel like in California it makes it really hard. Oh, I would agree with that. But also the reimbursement levels of Cal like I said, California has 30,000 dentists, right? Double the next closest state. So the reimbursement levels at the payer mix and on the payer side are much lower because there's so many doctors there. Mm. So I tell everybody, listen, don't go to, I, I try to talk everybody out of going to California, to be honest with you. All the new grads I talk to, because competition is so fierce. Yeah, You're right, in, in Santa Barbara, you're probably looking at a pure fee for service practice or a very couple of PPOs where reimbursements will be decent. You'll be able to make your money, but again, you're, you're paying for it, right? Oh, like, you're gonna pay for it, yeah. You're, the, the difference yeah. is, yeah, that's so hard. And good luck getting a hygienist to move there or something, they can't even afford to, to live there. Like it's that kind of, you have to well, kind of bust people in almost. A lot of my clients now, I will tell you, not even doctor recruitment, it's hygienist and assistant recruitment post COVID has really taken a hit. Yeah. The hygienist population just, you know, they lost like I think 5% of the total population. Not only that, but the cost, the labor cost. You know, back in the day, we were paying hygienists 35 bucks an hour in Portland. Now they're getting like 50 to 60 bucks an hour. It doubled in like three years. Yeah. And that impacts your bottom line, right? So, and especially and a lot of these hygienists aren't producers. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like you they're not, it's not like they're hygiene. sending treatment over to the doctor. They're just cleaning teeth and going about their day. That's exactly. a problem. So, right. so what do you, so what's your prediction for the future? So, so we just came out of COVID. Uh, we had a big dip in dentistry, but we also had a big spike. If you were in the top 10% of practices, so one thing I noticed, Ron, during after COVID, the practices we worked with, they almost yep. all grew. And I yep. thought that was the dental industry. It wasn't. It was just like the top 10, 20% of practices. So now we have this spike. You have this dip, you have this spike. And now we're going into 2023 where they're saying, you know, p patients aren't going to be buying as much treatment. The ADA is starting to see that trend. Yep. You know, it, it, you got to have more new patients. New patients aren't showing up to appointments they're canceling same day at a higher rate than ever before hygienists yep. are you know double getting paid double plus you have an inflation still hasn't come i mean it's slowed down thank thank goodness but it's still it's still high right and and doctor recruiting is hard what's your prediction for recruitment moving forward well i feel like the the future of dentistry as a whole is becoming these smaller groups that are doctor led with a couple of doctor partners right like 10, 20, 30 practices that are all doctor led that may have a little bit of equity behind them, but not a ton so that there's a ton of pressure. Cause you know, I listen, I've dealt these equity firms, Gary, <laughs> you know, they come in and all, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy. We care about you, the patients, all that. When in the end of the day, they only care about EBITDA. EBITDA is the, <laughs> you know, that is it. Right. Yep. Uh, 
six months in, you know, nobody's smiling when your EBITDA is less than 10%, right? Um, so I do feel like the future of dentistry, I've seen a lot of these smaller groups that are like a couple of doctors got together from their study club. And I, they, one of them had two practices, one of them, you know, and they've gotten together and they're, they're forming their own little group. And the end goal, though, is they're going to sell to either a Heartland or an Aspen at 30 practices, but then they retire, right? Yeah. So you feel that that's, that's the future is just a bunch of, we're going to basically have small groups, small DSOs, and that's kind of the future of dentistry? Yeah, I do feel, and I also, yes, because my take on doctor, um, dental school graduates, they're becoming smarter from a business perspective. Yeah, they are. Every year. Yeah. So, and, and you know, the, the larger DSOs used to take advantage of the, their ignorance on multiple levels, man. So, you know, like I'll have these conversations with new grads and I'll walk them through, like, uh, you know, doctors have been out for 10 years, Gary, still have no idea how they're actually compensated, right? Like, um, I tell everybody, listen, 99% of the time you're paid on some form of collections. If somebody tells you it's adjusted production, all that is is fronted collections at the end of the day. They're going to adjust off what they can't collect. Adjusted production is a term created by some DSO executive to fool you guys into thinking you're paid on production. <laughs> and that's what happened, right? Uh, <laughs> yep, that's 100%. That's how it works in the business world. It's it's give the people what they want so you can get what you need, right? And so it's just right. like, cool, we'll call it, You want to be paid off a of collection? Uh, we'll just call it adjusted collection. So yeah, 100%. Okay, so, so if you had the whole dental world listening right now, so everybody in dentistry is listening right now, what would be your one message to them around recruiting? Be transparent about everything when, you know, like I'll give you an example, Aspen, their doctors see 20 to 30 to 40 patients a day, whether they're a new grad, whether they're an experienced doctor, they're on a three column schedule and they're doing probably between 40 to 50% removable procedures on any given day. But the way that they present that opportunity, 20% removable, you're going to see eight to 10 patients a day and you're going to have a lot of mentorship, right? Now that's just one example. Now Aspen's not the Aspen does a lot of things right. I love Aspen. They do yeah. a lot of things right. Yeah. Their model is absolutely fan it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And they're providing a lot of care to patients who otherwise wouldn't get it, right? Yeah. So please yep. don't get me wrong there. But so to the entire dental world, if you're hiring a doctor, just be for retention purposes, just be transparent and upfront. Yeah. Be honest with yourself about how much actual mentorship you're going to get. Be honest and upfront about yourself with how many new patients you expect to get, right? Like uh be honest and upfront about the fact, like I just had one uh, private practice owner in uh, Arizona tell me he's struggling with collections and he wants to be transparent with the associate he brings in. He just hired like a forensic accounting firm to come in and figure out what the hell's going on with collections. And he's being transparent about that. Imagine a DSO saying that nobody, nobody would do that. Yeah. I, it would be like suicide for them. Right. Yeah, so, would, yeah. you know, my suggestion is be transparent. Uh, uh, you know about everything about yeah. uh, about the opportunity this is so good i i, I we could spend hours on this i i literally am gonna schedule you again and bring you on and talk again but in the meantime if someone wants to reach out to you and and i know you're very selective about who you work with so i appreciate you just coming on and sharing all this but if someone does want to apply to work with you how do they reach out to you well you can go to www.thedentistagent.com that's my website uh, you can send me a message through there or my email is ron at the dentist agent.com v t h e dentist agent.com um and you know we can have a conversation i'm more than willing to talk to everybody i love helping doctors find the right associate because it's a win-win for everybody uh i like i said i'm you know i've been a director of operations for 11 practices at 18 million in revenue so i know the business side as well as i know the recruiting side i've been in recruiting for 25 years so usually when I have a conversation with a candidate and I lay out my experience, I immediately gain, gain credibility with them to an extent where I gain trust and I build a relationship. And I'm not presenting just another piece of paper to my clients. I'm presenting a relationship and a candidate that I've gotten to know. So, you know, that's how we work. That's awesome. Um, well, I love it. I love how transparent you are. I love how you share the good with the bad because I, I, you can't, a lot of people just share all the good and, and sugar lollipop side of it. But there's right. a lot, there's a lot out there and there's a lot to understand and a lot to learn. And you obviously know a lot about it. So I appreciate you coming on. I will definitely, definitely be bringing you on again. Cause I think we could go like round two and talk about retention and talk about the right way to build and all those kind of things. So I, 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 again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. It's been great. It's been great. It's been fun. Mm -hmm.